I'm Dorothea Wolfson, the director of the MA in Government Program at Johns Hopkins Advanced Academic Programs. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the centennial anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. After my talk, I encourage you to submit questions through the chat. Now in my talk today, I will provide an introduction to the politics of women's suffrage in the United States. And let me stress that it's only an introduction since this is a rich and complex topic. As a political theorist, I will especially focus on the founding ideas that gave shape to the movement. My talk will touch on the following themes. Abigail Adams and the promise of the American Revolution, the tension between the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the idea of Republican motherhood, the leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and the theory behind the Declaration of Sentiments, uh, the alliance between the women's movement and the abolitionist movement, and the causes of that alliance's demise, and finally, the passage of the 19th Amendment. Now, my goal today is to enable all of us to better understand the interplay between theory and practice in the struggle for women's equality. Now, next month, the United States will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, granting women in the United States the right to vote. It certainly is something to celebrate. And perhaps the best way to celebrate it, besides the obvious, which is for women to vote in November, is to think back to the women who paved the way for the rest of us. Now, theirs was a long journey filled with obstacles and struggles and disappointments, and yes, missteps. Now, one of the movement's founders, Susan B. Anthony, looked forward to the day when the right for women to vote would become the norm. But, you know, she also worried that we would forget about her and what she described as the handful of women who made it possible, such as Anthony herself, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and their successors, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul. As Anthony stated, we shall someday be heated, and everybody will think it was always so, but they have no idea how every single inch of ground that she stands upon today has been gained by the hard work of some little handful of women of the past. Now just think about that for a moment. Every single inch of ground that we stand on today can be traced to these women who worked tirelessly in the, grade of, in the face of great opposition to win women the right to vote. In the case of Stanton and Anthony, they each dedicated over half a century to the cause of winning the women's vote, although they never lived to see it actually happen. Anthony herself logged thousands of miles traveling and canvassing the country into her early 80s to win support for the vote. And of course, she was famously arrested for daring to cast a ballot in the 1872 election. Now the fruits of their labors are undeniable. Women today vote in larger proportions than men. In the United States in 2016, 63.3% of eligible women voted compared to just 57.3% of eligible men. Women in 2008 accounted for 57% of all bachelor degrees and 59.9% of graduate school enrollments. That women have been able to succeed so well after having been denied higher educational and career opportunities for well over half the history of the United States is rather amazing, especially given the fact that just a few generations ago, women were not allowed the right to vote, own property, or attend institutions of higher education. Now, with all this success, it's important for us to look back, especially this centennial year, and give credit to that little handful of women who persevered and won the vote. Inch by inch, they gained ground over the course of seven decades, starting in Seneca Falls in 1848 and culminating with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. But it's not enough just to look back. Uh, we also need to enter into their thoughts if we are fully to understand their achievements as well as some of their errors. Now, from the vantage point of 2020, it may seem puzzling that it took so long for women to earn something so basic as the right to vote. How is this long wait to be explained? Well, a little over a week ago, we celebrated the 244th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. From the outset, 
inspired by the Declaration of Independence, women appeal to the principles of natural right and equality to advance their cause. Stanton was in a sense, the founder of the movement for the equality of women. And she modeled her declaration of sentiments on Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. There is even a symmetry of sorts insofar as Elizabeth Cady Stanton penned the Declaration of Sentiments in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, which was 72 years after Jefferson's declaration and the 19th Amendment was enacted 72 years after the Declaration of Sentiments. Yet it is not to be forgotten that it took 144 years from the signing of the Declaration of Independence to the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. In other words, it took a long time. Now, why did it take five generations of women to live and die to get the vote? Why was the opposition to female equality so strong? And what ideas and interests fueled opposition to women's suffrage? And why did it take 50 years from the ratification in 1870 of the 15th Amendment which prohibits government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on race or color to the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which prohibits government from denying the right to vote based on sex. Well, to answer these questions, let's start from the beginning, so to speak, with Abigail Adams, America's first feminist. In her own remarkable life, she captures the tension between the Declaration of Independence's principle of equality and certain social realities then in existence. Now in a famous letter penned by Abigail Adams to her husband John in March of 1776, she admonished him that the revolution should include the emancipation of women. Now this was a moment in history that was fraught with danger in which the colonies were entering into a war with, with the great superpower of its time. Nevertheless, Abigail took the time to make the case for the liberation of women too. She wrote to her husband of threatening a rebellion if women were to be bound by any law in which we have no voice or representation. In the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than, with your, than your ancestors. Now, many of us are familiar with Abigail's famous plea to her husband to remember the ladies. However, less often quoted are the words that follow. Abigail went on to write of many vicious and lawless men who are not only threats to democratic government, but also to women. These lawless men, she said, use women with cruelty and indignity. They treat us only as the vassals of your sex. Now in her letter, Abigail called attention to the need not only for political equality, but also for social equality. Abigail's petition to John reflected the broader purposes of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. That is to defeat despotism in all its forms, including the subjugation of women. As we say today, the personal is political. Unfortunately, John did not take Abigail seriously and Abigail soon dropped the issue. As brilliant as, Abigail's, as, brilliant as Abigail was, she was the mother with a brood of children to care for and a farm to manage, a smallpox epidemic to fight, all while her husband was away in Philadelphia. Uh, that is, she was a mother with many responsibilities, not least of which was to care for her children. Now, much later in a letter in 1814, Abigail described learned women as rare as black swans, since domestic duties made it near impossible to engage in a life of study and other pursuits. Despite her own learning, Abigail wrote to John that she would only contend for domestic government, which she thought best administered by the female. Abigail's correspondence is filled with her concerns about shaping the character of her children, while she still remained engaged, though only from the sidelines, with the political scene inhabited by the men of her time. Now today, Abigail's talk of women being satisfied with administering the domestic sphere perhaps sounds retrograde. However, things were not as simple as that, as the case of Abigail herself illustrates. Now the answer of why it took so long for women to achieve political equality is mired in the contingencies of history. Uh, but to simplify, female emancipation took so long because of deeply entrenched social ideas about the role that women must play in a democratic society. 
Now, it was widely believed that in a democratic society based on equality, some class of persons needed to nurture, raise, and educate democratic citizens. Now, democracy required the overthrow of aristocratic and ecclesiastical authorities. It was thought by many that in the absence of these authorities, women would need to play a stabilizing influence. Women were most needed, as Abigail Adams indicated, in the domestic sphere. Or, as the historian Linda Kerber has observed, women were to fulfill the role of what she has called Republican motherhood and what other historians have referred to as uh, the cult of womanhood. As Professor Kerber explains, quote, the Republican mother's life was dedicated to the service of civic virtue. She educated her sons for it. She condemned and corrected her husband's lapses from it. That is to say, despite women being left out of the political sphere, women were assigned a role of crucial political importance, although it was an indirect one. Now, while we may look back at such notions as prehistoric, they were not wholly without some purpose. Um, I'll try to explain. Um, in 1776, the United States embarked upon a bold experiment of self-government, an extended republic like the world had never seen before. Political philosophers such as Aristotle and Montesquieu argued that a Republican form of government, unlike say a monarchical regime, needed to be animated by the virtue of its citizens. So who was to shape the citizens of this new extended Republic? Who would ensure that they would be prepared for self-government, unguided by example, um, by the aristocracy or an established church? Now, it is only a slight exaggeration to say that for the first time in history, an expansive private sphere was created where the work of making citizens would take place. There would be no established church to dictate what people thought or believed. And there would be no great lord of the manor to see to it that individuals were fed, housed, and clothed. As a result, civil society, and especially the home and the family, became central to the success of the political sphere. It was here in the private or domestic sphere that democratic self-governing citizens were to be molded. Now, while political theorists starting with Aristotle uh, had always seen the role of the family as central to any political order, the woman's familial role took on more urgency in the modern era. Philosophers such as David Hume and Adam Smith argued that women would play a pivotal role in socializing citizens. Writing somewhat later, Tocqueville noted in his classic work, Democracy in America, that women in the United States shaped mores and mores were understood to be indispensable to the success and the stability of American democracy. As Professor Kerber noted, the family essentially became the fourth political branch and took on a level of importance not seen in the old regime. That is to say, while women were relegated to the home, they nonetheless played a crucial role in shaping citizens, albeit by staying within the confines of the domestic sphere. As backwards as this may seem to us today, it was the commonplace understanding of the time. The structure of the family was understood to have a strong bearing on politics and more the overall health of democratic society. These were the theoretical underpinnings for why Abigail Adams and all the women uh, were left out of the revolution of 76. But there's a more practical reason as well. We must not forget that the amount of work that needed to be done in the domestic sphere was absolutely crushing. Consider what the average woman uh, gave birth in the early 19th century to eight children. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton herself had seven children. Not only did the American women need to care for them, but in many cases, homeschooling was the rule. Consider too, just what it took to wash the laundry. Doing one load of laundry required hauling 50 gallons of water, which totaled about 400 pounds, uh, soaking, boiling, scrubbing, rinsing repeatedly, and then hanging up the clothes and ironing them the next day. Housework was in fact, full-time labor. Now Stanton, who by all accounts very much enjoyed being a mother, still found herself drowning in all her domestic responsibilities and described herself as, quote, having suffered with mental hunger, which like an empty stomach is very depressing. As she bluntly put it in a letter to her cousin, quote, I am desperate sick of working and attending to the fleshly needs. She recollected in her autobiography about the general discontent of dealing with the duties of wife, mother, 
housekeeper, physician, spiritual guide, and the chaotic conditions that result without woman's constant supervision. Stanton's discontent captured what many women were feeling, if not expressing. Women's role was a burden to be sure, as Stanton expressed so well, but according to the conventions of the time, their role was essential to the success of American democracy. Now, this is why female equality was such a hard sell. There was a strong belief that the burden of the ballot, as some female anti-suffragettes called it, would distract women from their familial duties. Mothers held the family together. If given the vote, women would abandon their domestic duties in order to follow and get involved in politics. As such, female suffrage was seen as a direct assault on the principles on which it was thought the democratic experiment depended. Moreover, giving the vote to women would mean that the individual, not the family, was the basic building block of society. Now, this was indeed the implication of the Declaration of Independence, that the individual is the basis of the social contract, something Stanton fully expressed in a famous address she would give later in her life called the solitude of the self. But many Americans were not ready to embrace these implications. However, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was ready, and she started a revolution that changed the country. So in July of 1848, Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, and Mary Ann McClintock met in McClintock's parlor in Seneca Falls to plan a women's convention and write their own declaration. Now they initially looked for inspiration to various temperance and anti-slavery statements, but in Stanton's recollection of events, these seemed too tame and pacific for the inauguration of a rebellion such as the world has never seen before seen. After much delay, Stanton recalled, uh, one of the circle took up the Declaration of 1776 and read it aloud with much spirit and emphasis, and it was at once decided to adopt the historic document. So Stanton closely modeled the Declaration of Sentiments after the Declaration of Independence. Like the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Sentiments is rooted in women, rooted women's equality in the immutable laws of nature and nature's God. The laws of nature, Stanton wrote, dispose each person to seek their own happiness. Any law that abridges this pursuit is not valid. The opening of the Declaration of Sentiments borrows heavily from the exact language of the Declaration of Independence in terms of establishing the natural right to equality. As it states, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. Like Jefferson's declaration, Stanton's listed 18 grievances, but whereas Jefferson's are aimed at King George III, the grievances in the Declaration of Sentiments are aimed at the history of mankind or mankind as a whole. These grievances revolve around the political, social, and religious degradation of women. The first four grievances address the denial of political equality starting with the denial of suffrage and all this entails, including a lack of representative government for women. The fifth one goes further. As the declaration explains, in the case of married women, the US has rendered her civilly dead as all rights, including property and custodial, devolve to the husband. Employment and educational opportunities are also denied to women. And if they do find work, they are only given, in the words of the Declaration of Sentiments, scanty remuneration. Here we see an early demand for, as we say today, equal pay for equal work. But it's not just the laws themselves that are wrong, and this is important. As the grievances make clear, men have enforced social and religious stereotypes on women that give force to these laws. As the Declaration asserts, mankind has created a false public sentiment by giving the world a different code of morals for men and women. In the last grievance, Stanton accuses men of having endeavored in every way to destroy woman's confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Now, the 11 resolutions that follow seek to redress the grievances and call upon rescinding laws that limit the social, moral, and political equality of women. Significantly, all the resolutions passed unanimously at the convention, except for the one that called for women's suffrage. In fact, as Stanton recalled, 
there was so much resistance among the participants even to raise this revolution, fearing that a demand for the right to vote would make the whole movement seem ridiculous. Stanton's husband, who was fully supportive of her efforts, believed that the resolution calling for the right to vote would reduce the whole uh, convention to a farce. Even fellow organizer Lucretia Mott believed it was too much. In the end, this was the one resolution that did not pass unanimously, though it would soon become the linchpin of the women's rights movement. Now it's worth including what Stanton said when she introduced the resolution. She expressed her indignation and found it grossly insulting that so many rowdies and idiots, as she put it, were given the vote while civic educated women like her were denied. She said, and strange as it may seem to many, we now demand our right to vote according to the declaration of the government under which we live. The right is ours. Have it we must, use it we will. Now Stanton's speech was powerful, but so was the resistance to suffrage among the delegates at the convention. For a time, it looked like Stanton may have gone too far until one man from the floor asked to be recognized. It was none other than Frederick Douglass who spoke up for, seconded the, revolution, the resolution for uh, suffrage and who by all accounts swung momentum for, in favor for its eventual passage. Now it is significant that it was Frederick Douglass who spoke up on behalf of women's suffrage while the white men sat silent. The affinities between women's suffrage and abolitionism ran deep. Indeed, the close identification women felt toward the plight of African Americans enabled them to forge an alliance with abolitionist reformers. This important alliance provides us with a historical case study of what we might call today intersectionality. However, as I will describe, the women's movement support for the rights of all of African Americans was not lasting. Now the women who have become the early leaders of the suffrage movement honed their organizational skills and activism by first fighting for the cause of abolitionism. Indeed, in the 1850s, abolitionism became the leading focus of all reformers, including individuals who would emerge as strong advocates uh, for women's suffrage as well, including Frederick Douglass, but also male supporters like Henry B. Stanton, Garrett Smith, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and Charles Sumner. Female leaders active in the cause of abolitionism, in addition to Anthony and Stanton, included Abby Kelly, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, among many others. Now, women sought to draw parallels between the plight of enslaved peoples and their own degradation living as second-class citizens. Both causes drew upon the natural rights teaching of the Declaration of Independence. However, during the Civil War, women's rights took a back seat as reformers threw all their energies into the cause of abolitionism. Significantly, women played a leading role in this cause. Leaders like Angelina Grimke faced violent mobs while speaking for the cause of abolition. Lucretia Mott founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, preached before black churches, addressed anti-slavery conventions, and gave shelter in her home to fugitive slaves. Susan B. Anthony participated in the Underground Railroad and was the New York State agent for the New York Anti-Slavery Society. Abby Kelly was a radical abolitionist who worked closely with Garrison and caused a stir by lecturing before both men and women. Sojourner Truth spoke at women's rights conventions, most famously in Akron, Ohio in 1851. In this speech known as her an Ain't I Woman speech, she gave a stirring account of her sufferings and triumphs as both a woman and as a formerly enslaved person. Seeing women's fearless leadership for abolitionism, Frederick Douglass was impressed. Douglass recalled observing women's agency, devotion, and efficiency in pleading the cause of the slave caused me to be denominated a woman's rights man. Note how Douglass singled out women's agency, devotion, and efficiency in making reform happen. Their respect was mutual. In an 1860 speech to the American Anti-Slavery Society at Cooper's Union, Stanton acknowledged that this is the only organization on God's footstool where the humanity of woman is recognized, and these are the only men who have ever echoed back her cries for justice and equality. 
Indeed, the men involved in abolitionism tended to hold progressive views on women's rights. And women, because of their inferior status, brought special insights to the cause of abolition. As Stanton captured it so well, the badge of degradation is the skin and sex, the scarlet letter so sadly worn upon the breast. Now united in their subordination and commiseration, though as Douglas would later emphasize, women's plight could not be fully compared to slavery, they would work to lift each other up. In 1863, Stanton and Anthony started an organization and actively collected 400,000 signatures in support of the proposed 13th Amendment ending slavery. So because of women's unique understanding of the plight of enslaved after African Americans, it is especially tragic that some of the leaders of the movement for female equality later embraced the very racism they once opposed. So with the end of the Civil War, attention turned to securing the passage of the 14th Amendment to give African Americans the status of full citizenship as well as equal protection of the laws. This was seen by many to be uh, an opportunity for women. In extending the vote to newly freed African Americans, it could also be extended to women. Why not? As Stanton argued, while the constitutional door is open, we should avail ourselves of the strong arm and blue uniform of the black soldier to walk in by his side. Indeed, the thought was that upon the end of the Civil War, a new birth of freedom would include universal suffrage for all classes of citizens. Yet this was not to be. The 14th Amendment nullified the three-fifth clause of the Constitution that had counted enslaved African Americans as only three-fifths of a person in determining representation in Congress. This meant that the power of the South in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College would expand. Now for the North, however, it was important to protect the freedmen's actual right to vote. Otherwise, reformation of the South would be in vain. And for this reason, the second clause of the 14th Amendment specifies that the suppression of the vote of any male inhabitants of such state who are citizens and 21 years old will result in a reduction in the proportion of representation. Now, while there was political support for the 14th Amendment, Anthony and Stanton were alarmed by its introduction of the word male into the Constitution the preamble of which began more capaciously with the words, we the people, which as Stanton would later testify before the Senate, people includes both men and women, right? So the constitution had avoided the word slave or slavery, a fact that both Lincoln and Frederick Douglass used, used to promote the document, um, as in the words of Douglass as a glorious liberty document. Indeed, according to James Madison, the word slavery was not included in the Constitution in order to avoid giving moral sanction to slavery. So similarly, the Constitution was, in a certain sense, gender blind, insofar as it made no mention of sex in relation to voting, which it left to the states. Yet here, the 14th Amendment was introducing the word male as this distinct requirement for the vote, which of course set off alarm bells for the women reformers. To them, this seemed like a setback for the women's movement. Stanton's old ally, Wendell Phillips, countered that the focus of reformers must be on formerly enslaved peoples, one war at a time, he told them. This was to be, as Phillips explained, their hour. Once again, women were being told they would have to wait. So in the wake of the passage of the 14th Amendment, Stanton and Anthony sought to unite the Anti-Slavery Society with Women's Suffrage in a new organization, the American Equal Rights Association, or AERA. But the alliance was short-lived as some leaders in the women's movement began to believe that a quicker road to female equality was to be found by aligning themselves with various reactionary elements. In 1867, both women's rights advocates and advocates for the freedmen's vote focused on a suffrage referendum in Kansas. Both sides hoped to win suffrage for African-American males as well as women. However, when Anthony and Stanton saw support declining among Kansas Republicans, they looked, they looked elsewhere uh, for support. So Anthony allied AERA with the racist millionaire and Copperhead Democrat, George Francis Train. 
Train helped to fund her efforts to support the referendum in Kansas. He spoke at rallies and bankrolled her newspaper, The Revolution. So Anthony would deliver her speeches, followed by Train, who filled his remarks with racist invective. To her discredit, Anthony would just look on in silence. It seems she was adapting to an insight that Stanton would later express. To quote Stanton, it seems to me it would be right and wise to accept aid from the devil himself, provided it did not tempt us to lower our standard. But women in fact did lower their standards and both the rhetoric and associations reflected this shift. Anthony would align herself with Southern women who wished to rid black women from the movement in order to advance the cause of women's suffrage and white supremacy in the South. Later in 1895, Anthony would ask Frederick Douglass, you know, the man who had seconded Stanton's resolution for suffrage in 1848 to not attend a women's rights convention held in Atlanta in order not to alienate the white women whose support she needed. Anthony had become so singularly devoted to advancing women's suffrage, even if it meant compromising her former belief in racial equality. Perhaps beaten down after so many defeats petitioning the government, Anthony shared this insight in 1891. Quote, governments never do any great good things from mere principle, from mere love of justice. <clears throat> now, many leaders of AERA became especially incensed by the passage of the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment specifically protected the right to vote based on race, leaving out women once again. To the leaders of AERA, this was a provocation, and they responded by opposing the 15th Amendment. Now, the break between the two movements, former allies seemed irreparable. Taking notice of AERA's abandonment of the cause of racial equality, Douglas argued at their 1869 convention, I do not see how anyone can pretend that there is the same urgency in giving the ballot to woman as to the Negro. With us, the matter is a question of life and death. In response to Douglas, Stanton unleashed a barrage of nativist and racist rhetoric. She turned on immigrants, singling out the Irish and Chinese, as well as the freedmen as not only inferior, but as potential enemies and future oppressors of Anglo-Saxon middle-class women. Susan B. Anthony adopted similar rhetoric and sentiments. Now it's worth noting that not everyone did this. Other leaders such as um, Lucretia Mott, Abby Kelly, and Lucy Stone, they supported the 15th Amendment and saw victory for one aggrieved group as hope for another. As Stone put it, quote, I will be thankful in my soul if anybody can get out of this terrible pit. So the women's movement uh, turned to racism is extremely disappointing. Indeed, it would taint the women's movement and its legacy, as well as its momentum. It may lead us to question their sincerity in supporting abolitionism in the first place. Did they view this alliance in purely expedient terms all along? How could the common threads of hum human rights um, and equality have unraveled so quickly otherwise? Now, those in the women's movement who had opposed the 15th Amendment, led by Stanton and Anthony, formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, which allowed only female officers and focused on suffrage for white women only. Meanwhile, those who had favored the 15th Amendment, led by Elizabeth Blackwell and Lucy Stone, formed the American Women's Suffrage Association, which focused on suffrage for both men and women, <clears throat> regardless of race. Now, the splintering of the movement and the rivalries that ensued further delayed progress in advancing women's suffrage. Finally, after 20 years, these two groups merged under Stanton and later Anthony's leadership in a new organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. Unfortunately, this new organization, even with the deaths of the matriarchs, you know, Stanton and Anthony in 1902 and 1906, it didn't return to making common cause for the rights of all. Under the leadership of Carrie Chapman Catt, NASA would continue to align with segregationist Southern suffragettes, as with the National Women's Party, which was later founded by Alice Paul. Now, one of the more revealing incidents of the women's movement's new tactics was on display during NASA's Washington, D.C. Parade of 1913. The parade was organized by Alice Paul, who strategically scheduled the parade for the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, 
Now, it was a brilliant move that would garner nationwide attention for the cause. However, though NASA allowed its African-American chapters to march, they segregated them to the back of the parade. Ida Bell Wells, a formerly enslaved person, journalist, and one of the eventual founders of the NAACP, was a member of the Chicago delegation of all African-American women. After being told by NASA's leadership to march at the back of the parade, Wells waited on the sidelines and memorably claimed her rightful spot marching alongside the Illinois delegation. Well, an opportunity of mixed blessing for women arose with the advent of World War I. As devastating as that war was, with over 8 million deaths worldwide, it proved to be a boon to the women's suffrage movement, both in Great Britain and in the United States. In fact, it would take World War I to finally galvanize public opinion to support women's suffrage. American women made valuable contributions to the war effort. Thousands of women volunteered for the American Red Cross and Salvation Army, going overseas where they served on the front as nurses, ambulance drivers, physicians, linguists, humanitarian relief workers, and entertainers for the troops. On the home front, they took on jobs traditionally filled by men, working in munitions productions and factories, and led efforts to raise funds for the war and liberty loan drives. However, the women's movement split on how to promote the cause during World War I. On the one hand, Carrie Chapman Catt pledged NASA to fully support the war effort, adding departments to their organization on food conservation and overseas hospitals, for example. Now this helped to possession, position NASA and women's suffrage as patriotic organizations, increasing sympathy for the cause. On the other hand, Alice Paul and the NWP continued to agitate more actively for women's suffrage. In fact, throughout the war, Alice Paul and NWP began the now venerable tradition of picketing the White House. NWP's uh, silent sentinels would stand at the gates of the White House bearing signs such as, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Or, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? These protests were viewed, though, with growing hostility as unpatriotic and detracting from the war effort. The silent sentinels were simply exercising their First Amendment rights to peaceably assemble. However, they were arrested on technicalities, such as obstructing traffic. And once imprisoned, they were uh, treated very harshly. In protests, Alice Paul and others who were arrested went on hunger strikes and were brutally force fed. Prison authorities even threatened to put um, Paul, Alice Paul into an insane asylum. So the strategies of NASA and NWP differed significantly here. The more radical and confrontational NWP brought much attention to women's suffrage through their protest, coupled with harrowing news accounts of their treatment in prison. By contrast, NASA softened the image of women suffragettes by supporting the war effort and courting President Wilson. In the end, World War I proved to be a turning point for female equality, both socially and politically. In 1918, the House passed the 19th Amendment. President Wilson appeared in the Senate to urge them to do the same, famously saying, we have made partners of the women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? The bill died in the Senate, but was finally passed the next year. On August 18th, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify, achieving the necessary three-fourths of the states to pass the amendment. On August 26th, the 19th amendment was certified and made official. So in concluding, why we remember them? So the women's suffrage movement started with high aspirations, nurtured by the principles of equality and natural right as found in the Declaration of Independence. It was arguably these principles that made their noble alliance with the abolitionist movement possible. And it's important to remember that even before Seneca Falls, women were not passive actors or without some historical agency. As discussed, even with the vote, Without, I'm sorry, without the vote, um, women played a key role in shaping the early republic as leaders in what Professor Linda Kerber termed the fourth branch of government of American politics, the family. 
As important as this indirect role was in stabilizing the young republic, it could not be reconciled with the natural right teaching of the Declaration of Independence, which Elizabeth Cady Stanton was quick to recognize put women on an equal footing with men in all respects. Now Stanton and others launched a movement in 1848 that would take many twists and turns over the next 72 years. That the women's movement met with such broad and deep resistance, even after the formerly enslaved African-American men received the right to vote, it was difficult for some of its leaders to accept and it brought out a darker side to the movement. So one takeaway from this history is that although the cause for women's equality was just, the women's movement acted in, in, at times in ways that were unjust. It was progressive and reform-minded, but like any other cause, it faced hard political realities and limited policy windows. The strength of the resistance to women's suffrage ended up distorting the reformers' commitment to justice as such. Instead of seeing their predicament through the lens of our common humanity, they embraced the Machiavellian principle that the end justifies the means. In their view, if this meant embracing white segregationists in their Southern strategy for votes, then so be it. If it meant being silent when one of your supporters uh, spewed racist rhetoric, then so be it. But such political expediency came at the cost of the women's movement's moral authority. The road to women's suffrage was long and hard, filled with political and moral compromises and questionable and regrettable alliances. In this sense, Women behave no better, but also no worse than men. Politics is an art in which few succeed in summoning up, as Lincoln said, the better angels of their nature. Still, if we view the accomplishments of women reformers in the context of the obstacles they face, it is remarkable that they were able to persist in the face of great prejudice and even brutal per persecution. It is their persistence and fighting spirit notwithstanding the moral failings of some of their leaders that continue to inspire us today. It was a movement led by women and populated by women that gave voice to women, a voice to finally claim what is rightfully ours. Eventually, this little handful of women was joined by thousands of nameless women um, of diverse backgrounds who together succeeded in changing the culture and paving the way for American women of all races to exercise the vote and to accomplish great things. We do well to remember them, despite their even their troubling flaws. And I just want to uh, thank you. Um, I wanna welcome your questions and bring your attention as well to this great website that the JHU Suffrage Centennial Commemoration Committee has put together. I urge you to visit this website to learn more about the history of the 19th Amendment and female empowerment. Um, and you can also keep the conversation going via Twitter at hashtag JHU Women's Vote 100. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so I see a question here. Um, how did Stanton share the Declaration of Sentiments with the public? Was it printed for distribution? Uh, yeah, you know, it's really interesting because um, there isn't a copy of the original Declaration of Sentiments um, anywhere. It was lost somewhere, perhaps in a fire, so we don't have an actual copy of it. But uh, Frederick Douglass was instrumental in printing it um, and, and, and sharing it uh, widely uh, in, in the United States. So we really have him to thank for even having any copy of it um, in, that, that, that we have today. Um, okay, uh, here's a question. Uh, from from Lilia, if the idea of Republican motherhood ended with the success of women's suffrage, did Frieden's second wave feminism of the 1960s further this break? Is there space for both suffrage and such motherhood? That's a great question too. You know, I, I thought of Brady Frieda and I, I shared the quote um, that um, Katie Stanton shared about how she found, she loved being a mother, but she found it draining and, and, and depressing because she, it, it, it sort of closed out other outlets for her talents. Um, and certainly Fried Friedan was highly instrumental and influential in bringing on that second wave of feminism and drawing attention um, to this, this problem that has no name, I think as she described it. Um, I think you're asking, is there space for both suffrage and such motherhood? Um, you, right, you know, what's what's kind of interesting about that is in a way, I didn't really discuss this, but um, you know, 
suffrage really took off very early in, in the Western states. Um, by the time that, that the Congress in 1918 had approved the, 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 the amendment, uh, 13 out of the 16 states in the West had already had some suffrage, maybe m some partial, but uh, you know, Wyoming starting uh, you know, uh, first. Um, so the argument then was in a way, a Republican motherhood argument to give women the vote. In other words, to amplify their influence um, in the family by giving them a political voice. The thought was, I mean, some, I mean, it's debatable, but some historians have argued that that the West wanted to give women the vote in part because there weren't that many women out there and this would attract more women. But they thought by giving women the vote that they would have a positive influence on public policy by voting for laws that would further civilize the West and, and perhaps clamp down on, on some of the problems of lawlessness in the West. That was a great question. Okay, here's a question. What were the circumstances surrounding the break between the abolitionist and women's suffrage movement? Yeah, you know, it's really hard to fathom how this break happened in some ways because the women, the, the leaders of the women's movement were essentially abolitionists before they were even thinking about the cause of women's suffrage. Um, they cut their teeth on the abolitionist movement. They were given great voice and, and empowered by the, uh, abolitionist movement and able to speak in public about this cause. But the real break came and they were upset about the 14th Amendment because they thought they would be able to um, march in, you know, uh, and have universal suffrage. I mean, the thought was that with the end of the Civil War, we had, as Lincoln said, a new birth of freedom. And that new birth of freedom would include universal suffrage for all classes of citizens. And that didn't happen. But they were told, it's okay, we have to focus on the newly freedmen. Uh, they really need the vote more than you at this point, um, given everything that they've gone through. Um, so they were okay with that. And then they still tried to keep that alliance together with the new organization, which they brought the uh, former abolitionists and others into the American Suffrage Association. But then uh, with the passage of the 15th Amendment really marked the break because with the 15th Amendment, the, the suffrage was given to males um, and, and not to women. And that was really too much for them to accept. Um, not all of them, of course. As I mentioned, there were some, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, who kept the alliance together and saw the common humanity and the common cause that they would have uh, for, for African-American suffrage and women's suffrage. But, but Stanton and, and others just, just broke off at that point. They felt like they were betrayed, actually, by not being able to, to get the vote alongside uh, with the newly freedmen. Um, Here's a question from Tree. Uh, did the general public care how the suffragettes were treated while in prison? Well, yeah, I mean, the country was divided at the time. I mean, there were some who thought that some of the tactics that the NWP and that Alice Paul was taking were disruptive and, 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 and hurt the war effort. But as reports started leaking out in the press of the treatment that the women had in the prison, that did galvanize the public and increase sympathy for them. So it was a two front battle. You had, you know, uh, uh, Carrie uh, Chapman Catt, who was courting the president and had a more conservative approach uh, uh, to, um, to, to sort of showing how suffrage, the suffragettes were really engaged in a patriotic effort to support the war. Then you had Alice Paul and the protests, a peaceful protest. I mean, they were arrested on these, these technicalities. Uh, but when attention was brought to how they were treated, that did, I think, move the public to see that something has to be done um, and, and, and help pave the way to for the vote, World War I and those protests together. Um, here's a, a question from Allison. Was there any collaboration between the suffrage movement in the United States and the UK? Yeah, well, Alice Paul spent time in, in the UK and that's where she learned a lot of these more militant tactics. And so when she came back to the United States, she was ready for a fight. And that caused a little bit of friction with the established leaders of the time, you know, who wanted to not take such a confrontational approach as they had in Great Britain. And what's interesting is that Great Britain did secure the suffrage for a limited amount of women in 1918. Um, but it was suffrage, I think, limited to women who were 30 or over and had certain had to have certain property qualifications. Um, so there, there was some symmetry there and there was some collaboration as far as, um, you know, Alice Paul and learning and a lot of tactics that were working in Great Britain. But we actually got full suffrage um, earlier. I think in Great Britain, it was 1928 where they finally extended suffrage uh, universally. Um, a question from Barbara. Um, do you think that 
the fact that so many women had dads not present during World War II, for example, my mom was pregnant and dad left and met me when I was three, no attachment. Was What was the effect on, on the new wave? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. I'm sorry, maybe I, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure about the question, sorry. I, I, I think I'm not quite sure what you're asking. You can please uh, be a little bit more specific. Um, Christine, from Christine. Do you have any insight or research that explains why Maryland took so long to ratify the 19th Amendment? If not, can you provide any direction or resources that might be helpful? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the states, um, some of the, I guess Maryland, you think of sort of as the more Southern state, they were a little bit slower, you know, in approving the vote. And um, I don't have any resources in particular for that, but you should definitely go to the website. There might be something there about it the more local nature of the suffrage movement in Maryland, that could be helpful um, to you. Um, and Bess Vincent, I wanna give a plug for her. She's done an incredible job uh, pulling together all sorts of resources on, on with her work on the committee and organizing events and activities. Um, so just definitely go to, to the website for that. From K Katerina, are there any classic great examples of women's suffrage, the story of women's suffrage in literature and culture? Um, yeah, no, I think a great, great question. I mean, now with the centennial anniversary, there were so many great um, documentaries. Um, there, there was one recently that's been released by PBS on Carrie, Kett, uh, Carrie Chapman Cat. Um, Ken Burns some years ago did a great one for PBS on, on women's suffrage that I thought was just excellent. Um, and I know there have been some movies as well. Um, Hilary Swank started a movie that really showed the life of Alice Paul. Um, there are great museums. There's the Alice Paul House right here in Washington, D.C., um, and a great website where you can learn more about um, their, their stories. Oh, here's Barbara's clarification, sorry. Okay, on feminism, on the strength of our generation and de the demand for women's rights, the new wave of feminism, for example, our mothers, those born in the 40s, thought we were daft. Oh, I see. So you're saying, yeah, well, you know, you realize that the right to vote is, is, is relatively new. I mean, it's just a hundred years. So that's not that many generations ago. Um, I come from a family that has very um, sort of gaps in their generations. I mean, my grandmother was born in 1872, believe it or not. And my dad was in his fifties when I was born. She was in her late forties when he was born. So it really, you realize um, how recent this is and how some women um, were content. I mean, the first wave of feminism, of course, was all about getting the vote. And that was the most important um, the most important right. I mean, for Susan B. Anthony, I mean, she was very much in, in, uh, looking for you know, she, she wanted to encourage property, you know, reform and property laws, marriage laws, educational laws, but the vote was so primary because that would enable the other things to come, she thought. And so then with the second wave, when things were expanding, that might've seemed, uh, you know, for the first wave of feminists, like this isn't as important perhaps, I, I'm not sure, but that, that's a great question uh, from Ken. Um, what of other political precedents for women's suffrage? Widows could vote in New Jersey in the 1790s. Lincoln described himself as supporting of women's suffrage in the 1840s. Yeah, well, like I tried, I tried to say earlier that even though women were not allowed the right to vote, um, they had they played a cru crucial role in the republic, as as Linda Kerber has explained with Republican motherhood. Um, yeah, Lincoln uh, ahead of his time to support suffrage in the 1840s. Um, Lincoln, uh, you know exceptional leader who really had a vision for America that was way ahead of his time. But yeah, I mean, there was some, maybe some presence. I mean, there were some states that allowed African-Americans to vote, right? Um, early and then that, that was taken away. I think that the, that's why the Declaration of Independence is so important because I think it did, there was a moment there and, and, and Abigail Adams captured that, I think, where she heard that John and his colleagues were we're planning a, a Declaration of Independence in the spring of 1776, and she seized upon that moment. It, 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 it lit a fire in her that that there are universal human rights out there that women can appeal to, that, that enslaved peoples can appeal to. So I think it did plant a seed to people who are willing to listen to it, although it took a long time for it to, to catch, you know, to, for the rest of America to catch up to that. 
uh, from Sarah. Do you believe that women recognizing the moral missteps of the movement back in the early 20th century might help motivate women to promote racial justice today? Yes, I think that's so true. I think that's, you know, that's why I think it's important to bring this out, that the leaders in the movement that, you know, I discussed, Stanton, um, Anthony, I mean, they were visionary and, and they had an early commitment to equality and they saw their own equality as part of a bigger, a bigger fabric of universal equality. They could see their relationship between the advancement of formerly slaved peoples and theirs. It was all cohesive and together and it was unfortunate that it broke. But looking back now, we could see you know, that was a mistake that that had that should not have had to happen. So I think it can help us to rededicate ourselves to uh, seeing all of us connected together in that quest for more perfect equality for all people, all classes, all races, all genders. Uh, from Deborah, were there any countries that allowed women to vote prior to the success of the women's suffrage movement? Um, Yes, um, Australia was very early. I think in the early 1900s, they allowed for suffrage, one of the very first uh, countries to do so. Um, now, Great Britain beat us slightly in 1918. They allowed for partial suffrage of, of, of their women. They had to be 30 years or older and have certain property qualifications. But the United States really in 1920, by um, granting universal suffrage to, to women, really, um, really um, set, set history in motion by that. Um, when you consider that France, for example, um, they did not get the suffrage to women until 1945, and that was limited to literate women. And for Great Britain, it wasn't until 1928 that it became universal suffrage, um, not even there weren't any qualifications for it. So the United States, even though it took so long uh, from, the, from 1776 to 1920, we were relatively ahead of the rest of the world. Um, uh, on suffrage for women. Another, oh, 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 and I'm sorry, here's a question from Carol. With respect to that question, why might they have been more amenable than the United States? Oh, other countries. Well, I'm not sure about, I mean, Australia, I'm not, I'm not sure. They were they, they were ahead of the, the United States, but like I said, the United States was pretty much right at, right at the cutting edge here. And I think in part because we had this idea, this ideology of from the Declaration of Independence that really um, inspired um, not only the not only Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but the, the, ma the male supporters too, who helped early in, in the movement. Um, from Allison, how do you think the, my way or the oh my way or the highway mentality that is so present nowadays affects the continuing struggles towards women's rights. I by my way or the highway. I, I'm not sure quite what what you mean by that. Are you just saying that there's not sort of toleration for the different facets of the women's movement and, and what what they want to achieve? Or are you saying that there's still this kind of I'm I, I'm not sure what you're getting at there. I'm sorry. Uh, from from Maki. Could you please recommend any documentaries or books on black suffragettes and what they had to go through with opposition on so many fronts? Um, yeah, I think Elaine Weiss has done some work in this area. Um, yeah, we certainly need to draw more attention to the great contributions that um, that uh, African-American black suffragists made to the movement. I mentioned Ida B. Bell Wells, um, who was very influential and very brave in the, how she stood up to uh, the, um, the establishment and marched in that parade along Inside the Illinois delegation. Um, I might have room for one more question, I'm not sure, but I know we're running short of time, um, but I really appreciate all the questions that have come. Oh, okay, here we go. Here's a question from Sydney. To, um, since, since countries like the UK, Germany, and India had women heads of state long ago, why do you think we have not yet to have a, a president? Oh my gosh, that's the big question. It's really hard to explain, actually. I, I really can't explain that. I think that we're really due for that. We're really due to have a female president. In my lifetime, I, I certainly hope so. Um, it, it seems incredible that we haven't. Oh, okay, and last question from Norco, why women votes were by states and then universal? Well, I think that the state by state approach seemed to be the more prudent and, um, and sort of more incremental step that women can take to, to win the vote. As you saw, the, the opposition to the women's vote was so entrenched uh, that to call for a, 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 you know, a, a constitutional amendment was just too big of a, 
of a grab, or too big of a reach. So what the uh, what NASA did was that they they tried to focus on state by state. They tried to they 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 would get in touch with the representatives and the senators of each state where they thought they could make some inroads into the vote. And so it was a more incremental approach, but both 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 approaches ultimately ended up working. All right, well, thank you so much for, for all your questions and for listening to me today. Um, I really hope that you will uh, take, a, take some time this year uh, to celebrate and commemorate the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Thank you.